Hello, everybody. I'm at the Conjuring Arts Center with Ricky Smith. Who's and, that? Well, it's a handsome young man. <laughs> oh, shucks. That's what my mom says. <laughs> yeah, so she does. <laughs> Many people say that. Um, but we're here for another book club live stream. And the book that we're going to be talking about is a book that we gave away a few weeks ago, The Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnase. Who is that, by the way? Um, some railroad guy. I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm joking. I don't know who it is. Yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> um, but we're going to be talking about the book. We also released a new um, Bible edition of it. Ricky has his. It's great. Fits in your pocket. Best version ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing because it's a step up from the previous version, which was already perfect. So that means this one is even more than perfect. Exactly. If you don't have this, buy it. It's on our website. Only $20, something like that. Uh, and we won't have many for long. Our first edition sold out over 10 years ago, and and uh, they're highly prized. So, Anyways, yeah. let's get into the actual contents of the book. Why don't we actually pull the book out so we can go yeah. through some stuff? You can um, get your own copy. You so, can get them at Conjuring Arts, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably know more about the book than I do. I I read this maybe I first started reading it maybe ten years ago or so. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book, okay. where it came from, and well, it's super awesome. Um, I I first learned about it maybe when I was eight or nine. And it was just on a list of books that every magician should have that uh, uh, one of my magic classes said, you know, it's like stars of magic, expert at the card table, expert card technique. And uh, so I, I made it a point to get all the books on the list. And uh, I got this one, you know, and you open it up and you're like, the first half is card table artifice. What the hell is that? You know, and then uh, it's about shuffling and stuff. And then you get towards the back, and there's uh, the ledger domain section, and that's like the magic section. So I thought, that's the part that's for me. You know, I'm a magician. I'm no uh, cheater or anything. And uh, so I started reading that, and he talks about the overhand shuffles, you know, from the earlier part. And I'm like, I don't want to learn overhand shuffles. I want to learn riffle shuffles, or, you know, <laughs> with bridges, you know, man stuff. And, you know, clearly I didn't get it at the time. And so I ended up using it as, uh, you know, just a reference. If someone brought up the diagonal palm shift or something like that, I would go to the book and read the diagonal palm shift and try to learn it from there. And uh, that's not the best way to read this book, actually, because it's a whole system of card handling in these pages. And as a whole, it's one of the best systems, you know, known to mankind. It's amazing. The overhand shuffles work seamlessly with the palms and all the theory about uh you know uniformity of action and things like that really work well together and it gives you a great understanding of how card handling should be as a whole you know unless you're a bungler or something if if you want to suck then you could do a different book so, so i have a question <laughs> uh you, you talk about there's a system in it and when i read it i i that's one of the first things that i noticed there's a clear system and it seemed, at least from the first part, to be within the strict context of some sort of a card game, correct? Yeah. And I guess a lot of people look at it like that, and then they're not interested. How can you use the stuff for magic? I, you do have to adapt it, but it really is like uh, you learn the system, and you're not learning any single move that's going to, like, a lot of them you're going to use quite frequently, but really, you're looking to learn many of the moves and uh, many of the concepts until you form like a next level, level like a meta understanding of card handling in general. Like, you shouldn't be doing weird stuff for no reason. It should all be justified and natural. And uh, I don't know. Well, it, it's I, interesting because so the system describes. Uh, re reflects all the maneuvers somebody would make if they're actually shuffling and dealing legitimately in a game. Yeah. And I, I find it extremely interesting because it all revolves around those actions that people do legitimately. And 
does the magic section uh, have that same clarity in terms of the moves? I thought for sure. You know, some people have talked about the magic section maybe being from a different author or something like that. And I found that some of the tricks, you know, uh, don't exactly correspond with, um, you know, like he should use the diagonal palm shift for every trick, but sometimes he uses a shift and a palm, you know, for a, a trick, which he earlier had said, you know, like, you should avoid this, you know, do something more efficient. And, uh... So you wonder, like, how many of the tricks he was actually doing or just added in. But I found, you know, later on looking at it, that a lot of those tricks do have, you know, like, brilliant touches and some of the same thinking. So I discount, you know, that it's written by uh, multiple people. And I think the magic was just something that he knew and was fun. And maybe he didn't put all the thought and time into it as he would have if, he had come to magic later, maybe. But I I think there's a whole system for, you know, he talks about doing the, the different overhand shuffles for, um, you know, magic-related stuff, which, when I was growing up, seemed so old-hat and old-fashioned. and What, an overhand shuffle? Yeah, but <laughs> now it's some of the best, uh, you know, like a riffle shuffle will really draw attention to your hands. It's a loud noise it makes brings a lot of attention where you don't want it mm -hmm. and so following it up with a quick overhand shuffle or having a card taken back and doing like a quick overhand shuffle control you know you're uh you've drawn much less attention to yourself that you then uh, it's much easier to serve it back to the spectator where uh you know it, it's funny i think it even mentions in the book that the overhand shuffle is like the, the the most common type of shuffle and then the riffle shuffle is like a new way of shuffling is that right uh, I, I think that's true I think cards were just so thick and gross you know back then or maybe just before then were they that cut? it was hard to you know like were they cut in a way them where like you could? this without them getting ruined no, but were they cut in a way where you could riffle shuffle them well back then I don't know you would know you live at the library and <laughs> can just go break out one of those old 1830s yeah, decks. Yeah, yeah, I'll just open up know. all the... I'll go to the rare book room and take all the rare decks. Um, uh, I, I still find it's true. You know, I'm, I'm out there working and you ask people to shuffle all the time. You know, they all want to be able to do the in the hands ripple shuffle with a bridge. That's the one that they think is like the coolest. That's the epitome of card shuffling for lay people. You know, they've seen people do the one on the table, but they don't know that it's more protected. They think it's like you suck and can't do a bridge. Yeah. And, uh, but most of the time, that's too dexterous for people. And so you see them doing this one, you know, this mm -hmm. one, or like the weave them together shuffle. And those are the most common ones. Same as Erdne said, you know, like a lot of people discount all these things because they're talking about working in a casino, which, who the hell works at a casino? I know one person. <laughs> you know? I don't. <laughs> um, actually, this is not true. But <laughs> how, how would you recommend, let's say somebody is trying to read this book, because it's an awfully uh, lauded book. Everybody talks about it and praises it so highly, but it is kind of hard to get into. Yeah. How would you recommend somebody study it for the first time? If somebody really wants to study it and they don't, you know, they've never read it before, they try to read it, but it seemed too hard, how would you recommend they start? Well, it, it took me a while. Like I said, I was using it as a reference point. And then uh, I was maybe five or six years into magic. You know, I was 14 or something like that. And uh, uh, Aaron Fisher, he, he told me, oh, you got to read the whole book all the way through. Like, you mean you haven't read all the way through? And I was like, no, I've just been, you know, I look up whatever I want to learn. And, you know, that meant I was missing out on a lot of the cool introductory parts and other things. And he's got bits of wisdom on almost every page. And uh, so on my flight home, I I read the book. You know, I had a I had a pounder, uh, Erdnays. I had a... Or no, that's not true. I had the Gambler's Book Club with the B cover, 
and then a, a copy of Expert Card Technique and Card Control by Buckley, all cheap paperbacks, and I just have them in my backpack all the time. So they're all like water damaged and crap, <laughs> crappy now. But uh, so I just had one on me, and uh, so the whole flight back, I just read the book all the way through, and I remember my brain exploding like a few times because because it's more like a system and you need to learn the whole thing to to get it. Uh, it, it took me sitting down and really reading through the book page by page to actually come to appreciate it more and actually understand it. And uh, so that's what I recommend. And, the, you know, it probably shouldn't be your first book, you know, but it should be your third or fourth book that you really, like, take to heart. And you should read the whole thing. You know, don't use it as a reference like I did. You're going to get a lot more out of it. Uh, just because you'll get the gestalt, you'll get the whole thing, and it'll take you to that next level. You know, one thing that I'm curious about, and I actually never even asked anybody about it, but there's, let me see where it is here. Da -da -da. Here we go. For, for the stock shuffling, uh -huh. does that have any application in magic yeah, that sure. you found? Yeah, you know, like, Maybe you're not doing any of these, but that's how uh, I think this Di is, Vernon's, you I, know, doing, like, cause out of it's sight, funny, out of mind. I think this part specifically is the drop-off point for many magicians. They get yeah. to it, and they're like, hmm, stock two cards, stock three cards, stock it for Euchre. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like... Uh, so, th Maddie's right. You know, like, you're going to hit this part, and you're going to be like, what do I need to know this for? But sit and work through it, cards in hand. This teaches you how to move cards around in the deck using an overhand shuffle. And uh, it does come in handy. You know, the professor used it to separate the cards for uh, out of sight, out of mind. He's taking uh, nine cards that people could have thought of and moving them to different places in the pack. And you're not going to use one of these exact things, maybe. But uh, at least you're getting the idea washed into you. This is how I can move cards around for... Uh, different magical effects using the overhand shuffle and uh what you want to do is work through these because some of them are hard and you're like doing lift shuffles and <laughs> <They're very> uh, <laughs> other things and uh, you'll be surprised when those two cards come out to you so it makes it fun but it's a good practice technique for all your overhand shuffles you know because you're going to learn like how it works you're going to learn them in more advanced ways doing in and out and then uh, you'll be better prepared for when you do want to use the overhand shuffle for something in one of your routines. You'll know how it can be applied and all the different ways that it works. You know, that's why it's a, it seems like something you might not need, but uh, it does give you a better understanding of how the shuffle works. I don't know. Um, something. The, the book, so the book was published in 1902. Correct. That's before I was born. Yeah, <laughs> before I was born too. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and I don't know how popular it was at the beginning, but it th it's so weird to me because there's so, been so many good books on sleight of hand, but this seems to be the most popular book of all time, in my opinion. I yeah. I don't know, if, maybe expert card technique, but not it doesn't have the same prestige as this. Can you yeah. talk about that and how? how it built that prestige and why it's lasted so long and been reprinted yeah. so many times. Well, I, I think it beats out expert card technique because expert card technique doesn't seem to me to be so cohesive. It's not a, like a system. It's like expert card technique was all the cool slides at the time, you know, like, mm -hmm. and there's chapters and different things, but it's not like here's how to become an amazing card handler. It's like, Here's a slight that's great. Here's here's another slight. Here's ten different versions of a slight that's great, you know. And like, uh, Ertnays, uh doesn't waste his time on too much stuff that's not great. You know, he might have it there for, you, you know, so you kind of know what he's getting at or something. But it's not like here's a variation. Here's a variation. Here's a variation. And uh, be, because of that, like people have used Erdnays to develop their own philosophies and like Di Vernon took Erdnays and made it into his philosophy and uh, expounded upon it so it's like a whole system that you can build on you know and make your own system versus like look at all these tools I have and I don't know how they work together 
and you know no one can go grab those same tools because no one's going to go grab you know the same 30 tools that you learn from expert card technique and then uh build it into their you know like overall card handling system i suppose and uh it, it's true no it's very true and you know another funny thing that i uh, that i notice nobody knows any of the card tricks from this book of all the people who who for you know Many people have this book on their shelf, and everybody pretends to read it. But if you show them a trick from this book, they'll ask you where it's from. Yeah, especially, Which, and there's some awesome ones, like the memorized deck tricks are mm -hmm. really stunning. And uh, I've done the card in the hat and the card through the handkerchief most of my life, only because I was very lucky when I was 15 or 16. I did see someone do those, and uh, it had like a profound impact on me because... You don't even see people doing palming that often. And so when that happens and someone palms well and that card actually, you know, it's not some weird cozy handling. It's like, here's the handkerchief, here's the pack, you know, I'll drape the handkerchief. It comes out beautifully. Uh, there's no extraneous motions. You know, they hold the hat up really nicely. It seems like the card's not even in yet. You square it in, shuffle, riffle towards the hat. Uh, these are amazing tricks and simple, easy to follow, and uh, I just remember seeing those tricks done for the first time and being like, wow, that's some great magic, and it, it's right here in a book that we all have, and it, I don't know. Um, no, it's, it's great. One of, one, of the, one of the most amazing things uh, to me is the section on the three-card Monty, which nobody talks about ever. And I, I never thought much about the three card Monty until I started reading the um, we, we put out another book for our book club called Forty Years a Gambler by George Duvall. It's a long time. It is a long time, and I think the book came out in eighteen uh, eighteen something eighteen ish. <laughs> eighteen. It came out in the late nineteenth century, and um, the guy George Duvall is mostly a three-card Monty uh, hustler. I mean, he hustles different games, but they talk about it in this, and he also talks about it in his book, about being a fair game. And it's interesting how... You, you sort of have to read the uh, George of All book, but I, I found it interesting, and I find it interesting that it's in here, but nobody... Everybody thinks of the three-card Monty today as like a very simple thing when... In reality, it's it's a pretty good game, and it can be played fairly, and be, you know, still fun without it being a cheating thing. As an aside, I saw an amazing thing recently at uh, just in Manhattan over at Shake Shack. You know, the three card money you got the bent cards, mm -hmm. and you have to have a you should have a reason to pick up two cards at the same time with one hand, and uh, this guy was doing it brilliantly. He had stolen a. Uh, one of those trays, a fast food tray from Shake Shack. So he was holding that in one hand and had the three cards there. And that was a perfect reason to use one hand for all the pickups and the throws. And uh, he was killing. And I didn't have the heart to tell anyone, you know, because I was like, he deserves their money. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> he does. Um, let's see. What, what last thoughts do you have about the book? Anything you want to say about the book or uh it's one of my favorites what i do is you know like the the pocket size has the great ribbon mm -hmm. and uh so i i keep one of those around you know here in manhattan you get stuck in public transport all the time so i just start reading from wherever the ribbon is and over the course of a year i read the book every year and I just kind of go through it and you'll always find new and cool things like I thought I knew some really cool things like I had found a few things that uh, people did weird or uh, sucked at and I found like the right way to do it in Erdnays and I was pretty happy and Bill Kalush has done the same and uh, shared a few of those things with me and then uh, I've read this book so many times you know and then still like uh, John Bodine and Benjamin Earl both study the book pretty regularly. 
And uh, every once in a while, they'll tell me something that I'd missed. Even in like the cool parts where I thought I was finding something cool, they found a, a meta cool thing, you know, because I was so flummoxed by the small cool thing that I found that I skipped over the other cool thing. <laughs> and uh, it happens all the time. But I would think of it almost like uh, create a little strategy for yourself. Uh, pick your favorite um, edition, put a bookmark in it, and just constantly go through it like a circular thing like you're never finished reading it and uh, you'll get a lot from it I how, think. how long have you been reading this book uh let's see like seriously where i read it through you know must be 20 years now i'm 35 you know i was like 14 or something when i started i read it like five times in a row the first the first time i read it 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 took me like by such surprise you know how great it was even the things that i had been trying to learn out of it uh i was getting more out of those things and uh so i read it a bunch of times in a row and then i thought you know what you should read this every year and what happened i would start you know and then something would come up and distract me and that's when the bookmarking thing started happening and then maybe uh 10 years in bill came out with the pocket edition and I was carrying a copy of the pocket. I was one of the first people to get one because <laughs> Bill sent a big box of them to H and R, and H and R was the only people that had them. So That's I, where you were working back yeah, then. Yeah, outside of New York, I was the only person, and I I got one really early, and I just carried it in my back pocket forever. It was like all beautifully like crushed and ruined, <laughs> and uh, like I had it, and I got to Manhattan. You know, I'm hanging out with Bill. And uh, we're talking about Erdnays, and I have my Erdnays with me all the time. And then uh, one time I went out to party with uh, Tony Chang in Queens, and I was coming back on the subway, and someone stole my cell phone. Uh oh. And instead of being like smart and going, like, I'll never catch this kid, his grandmother was part lightning bolt, you know, I was like, I said some <laughs> expletives, which I won't repeat right now, and I, I chased him. I chased him down these stairs across like a busy street. And uh, which was also stupid, you know, instead of your phone, you could lose your life. <laughs> and I ate it in between these two cars and just slid on the pavement, ruined my hands right before a 31 faces north. And the kid like laughed at me. He's like, that's what you get for chasing me. <laughs> and I was like, man, is there no end to your not niceness? And <laughs> it was true. He's probably the devil. And uh, anyways, the thing had fallen out of my pocket. And I didn't realize it, you know, I wasn't thinking the, the about book it. Fell out of your yeah, pocket. and so I also lost the one that I've been carrying around for maybe, what, like six or seven years or something like that. And uh, so I lost one of my constant companions. So I switched to another one. I, uh, I switched to an, another one of the pocket ones. And then I, you know, I didn't, I no longer had the connection. So when the indestructible, <laughs> when, when the indestructible one came out, I switched to that and then switched to this. You know, when these came out, these are nice, you know, the indestructible one is a little bit thicker and yeah. I might have been getting a bad back because of it, <laughs> but nevertheless. The, the great thing about this is uh, when you read it in public. Oh yeah, no one wants to sit next to you on the subway. Little old ladies <laughs> give you smiles, they're, they're thinking you're reading the Bible, uh, uh, and you're still reading it and you're still learning stuff every day, yeah. every time that you read it, even though you've been reading it for so long, right? Yeah, I just learned... Like, uh, I didn't find these myself, but uh, Benjamin Earl surprised me with a few new things, you know, just last weekend at Magi Fest. So, I don't know. I'm not perfect yet, but someday, you know. Someday. Someday. <laughs> someday well, I'll be like Maddie. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get you there, buddy. <laughs> Uh, so, Ricky, I wanted to thank you for coming yeah, in today. It really you. means a lot. It's always a pleasure to come by here. This is the greatest space of all time. Yeah, and come by more often, <laughs> and we'll have to do another one of these with another book. I don't know. Just name a book, and we'll we'll figure it out in a few months. You don't have to name it now, but... <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> all right, thank you guys right. for watching. Thank you, guys. We'll see you. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> Awkward poke.